G'day, Hawks fans. Uh, welcome, Reese. We're in for a good night tonight. How are you going, Reese? Mate, going well. Happy to be here and, yeah, very much looking forward to this one. Special guest, uh, Rick Ladson, to join us shortly. But, fans, um, as uh, everyone jumps in, let us know where you're tuning in from tonight. Um, Talking Hawks, we are just a passionate group of Hawks fans that we love connecting people around the world that love the Hawks as well, uh, have some intelligent footy conversation and, and a few laughs along the way. But connecting Hawks fans with uh, yeah, some amazing players that uh, yeah, Hawthorne's been fortunate to have, uh, Rick Ladson being one of them tonight. So uh, what we'll do tonight, race a little bit different. Um, we've done a little bit of homework. So we'll just chronologically, fans, um, we'll give you a few opportunities to, to ask some questions. But we're just going to go over um, Rick's career um, in, in a little bit of a chronological section. So if you've got some cracking questions and you can't help yourself, drop them in. We'll try and keep an eye on it. But um, if uh, if you can drop it in at the right time, we'll, we'll try and include as many as we can. So um, without further ado, um, welcome, Rick Ladson. Lado, thank how are you going? You. Yeah, good, thank you. Thanks for uh, inviting me on and having me. Welcome, mate. Welcome. Uh, we're, we're very privileged to have a, uh, a premiership player. So um been very keen um to hear all about your career and, and what's been going on in your world so mate um let's uh 2008 amazing we'll get to that what we want to do tonight is cover a bit of your i guess um i'll let reese do a little bit of an intro about your draft and whatnot when you came in as a junior we'll touch on a little bit of box hill but um go through your career at the hawks the premiership of course and what you've been doing since footy so uh reese go for it mate no problem. So 2001, uh, referred to as the Super Draft, which most fans associate with the top three picks. But at number 16, Hawthorne picked up uh, our special guest tonight alongside Luke Hodge, Campbell Brown, Sam Mitchell. Uh, heck of a draft, if you ask me. Um, Rick, when it came to you being drafted, how many clubs did speak to you and what happens in those discussions? Yeah, it was uh, it was a bit of a bizarre experience, really. I'd... Um I think I had every team except for Essendon that year or over the over the journey of that year and um, at least, you know, make contact um, or come to Bendigo to meet myself and, and my family. Um, but I still didn't think I was going to get drafted. So it was, yeah, it was a weird sort of thing. But, um, yeah, in those meetings, whether it be at draft camp or um, at your home, they're, they're asking personable questions and sort of getting to know you and, um, obviously, when they're with your family, like mum and dad, and they're asking questions about them, and they're just sort of getting a background on um, who you are as a person and, I guess, your upbringing, and um, they make a few cheeky calls to school, which wasn't <laughs> ideal for me. Um, but, yeah, it, most of it's pretty pretty chilled out. It, the ones at draft camp were probably pretty intense. I reckon the most intense one I had was um, Port Adelaide, um, and you've seen Mark Williams, you know, as a coach, I think he's fantastic, but he, he's very intense as a human. Um, I can say so, that. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. I wouldn't be game enough to do that to him. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, they they really put the, the, the torch, the blowtorch on um, in that, that interview, I remember, at uh, draft camp. But, yeah, ma majority were just basic questions about, you know, interests and school and, you know, your mates and, and little things like that just to get a background. Yep. So native of uh, Bendigo, um, pick 16, mate. Did you uh, – was that a surprise, getting caught out that early then? Uh, yeah, like I was just loving playing footy. Like it's funny when you go back to that um, that age, like I think back a long time ago now. Um, but, yeah, you just went out and just did your thing and there was just no, you know, concerns really. Yeah. Um, I, I was having a pretty good year at TAC Cup, and um, but I was just having fun. So I didn't really – yeah, I'd been talked to and um, obviously draft camp and things like that came along, but I still, in my mind, I was like, I'm only 17, I've got another year. So I was sort of in my mind planning for the year after, even though I'd had a lot of contact and, and things like that. But, um, yeah, back then it was on the wireless, so there was no <laughs> – no TV or anything like that. And uh, we still had a little a barbecue with family and friends. And, you know, I still didn't think I was going to get picked up or if I was going to get picked up, I thought it would be late. 
because I was only 17. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then got a phone call from my manager at the time who was Todd Viney. Um, yeah, and blown away. I was absolutely ecstatic to be staying in Victoria because there was a little, like, I'd had a few meetings with Port, so I thought if anything was going to happen, it was going to be with them, and they had picked 15. Yeah. Um, and they ended up taking Barry Brooks. So thanks, Barry. Um, <laughs> but, no, yeah, it was Barry. amazing. But, yeah, I, I genuinely didn't think I was going to get picked up, mate. So it was, <laughs> it was great. There you go. So Which team did that's you that's support as a kid? Oh, sorry, mate. Uh, yeah, I was, a, I, was a, I was a Tiger. So my dad, he was uh, he was mad Richmond. So, yeah, I just grew up loving the Tigers. My favourite player was Matthew Knight. Um, so I had the blonde hair and the left foot too. So everything he did, I just copied. He got a haircut, I got a haircut. He kicked a goal. I practiced that goal all week and for weeks on end. But, um, yeah, Tigers. When, when did Matty Knight uh, take over at uh, Essendon? In his coaching um, career? Didn't cross middle park. of 07, I think. No, no. So, he, yeah, well, he was, he was still playing at Richmond when we, I was at Hawks. So 2002, um, I got picked to debut and did my net training. And we were going to play Richmond in that game. Um, so I missed out on playing against Matty Knight. So I was devastated on all levels. Um, but Hodgie got to debut. So, yeah, thanks to me, <laughs> Hodgie. A legend he is. <laughs> Coming to a club that was only a kick and a half off a grand final, as we know, in 2001, were you expecting to play senior footy in 2002? Nah. And I don't know if you've seen some photos, but crikey, I was uh, 60 kilos ring and wet, you know. Like, I reckon the heaviest <laughs> part of my body was me little curly afro I had going. And, um, but, yeah. You did just, was a good was, afro. Yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> I don't um, remember Matthew Knights with an afro, so that's a bit interesting. Yeah, no, I grew it out there. And looked like noodles, but I thought, you know, the old girls <laughs> would get the girls scenario. But, um, yeah, I, I didn't expect to play, no. Um, I, you know, I hadn't lifted a weight in my whole journey. And then I get down there and there's these just beasts, you know, waiting in the in the gym and, you know, training and getting cleaned up. But, yeah, look, it was it was great to be acknowledged at that point, but yeah, it took a little bit longer because I missed the rest of that year and had to get back and um, put some weight on along the way. Yeah. Before we jump into the Hawks and the Box Hill, um, if there's any uh, good questions at this point, um, just who was your biggest uh, footy influence uh, pre pre being drafted? Yeah, the, like, my dad was um, fantastic for me. Um, he wasn't a pushy pushy parent who was just supportive and he coached me in under 12s and things like that so taught me the basics and um sort of nurtured me along the way so he was pretty laid back so i think i took on that attitude you know towards getting drafted and things like that so um he was probably the biggest influence but you know i was fortunate enough to have um a couple of cousins that were like my brothers and they were that little bit older than me so um they're dairy farmers from up Murrabit way up near Kerrang. Um, but those, Brad and Nick, their names were, and they were fantastic too, just um, guiding me along as well. So that, those three in particular. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, if there's any uh, fan questions that you'd love to throw in, um, uh, let Lado uh, give us your best. Um, Box Hill, we'll just quickly move there. Um, so that was a pretty decent team sort of that started to form. Around you, how was your how was your I guess uh, reception and initiation into the BFL? Yeah, it was uh, it was an eye opener, and you know, again, just a skinny little fella trying to find find his feet. And um, but Box Hill was amazing for me, and you know, whether that was the early days or you know the end of my career, I, you know, I've got nothing but fond memories um, of how I was treated, but you know how the team went too. I think. Early days there, we were playing pretty good footy and we played off in a grand final against Willie and, um, you know, Daniel Harford was still there and he's still a close mate of mine today. And um, So he took me under his wing early days. And it was just, even though he was sort of on the outer then, um, you know, I just made the most of having guys like that around you to, to learn from and, you know, establish yourself as a, a senior member. Um, yeah, and then 
I think I was pretty lucky to have some of the coaches we did down there too. You know, we had Tony Libertoro, Barry Mitchell, uh, Brendan Bolton was amazing as well, Andy Collins before Bolton and, and Damian Carroll. Um, you know, all fantastic people, but great coaches. So nothing but great memories for me with Box Hill. Hmm. Uh, it's been great. We've got down there a little bit uh, this year, just watching the, the guys, and it's a, a, a very committed um, fan base down there and, and everyone obviously helping at the club. It's just um, tapping into a rich legacy that uh, and, and it's the oldest uh, VFL, AFL um, partnership that was uh, yeah still going from the induction. So um, what have we got, Race? O2. Yeah, going to move field. on. Yeah, going to move on to your debut, Rick. Nowadays, when players get their debut, we've got social media videos of them calling their parents and getting very emotional. What was it like for you when it was announced that you were going to play? And then how did the family react when you told them? I think I had to send the pigeon back to Bendigo to let them know. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, look, it was just a tap on the shoulder. Like, yeah, I mean, um, that it's an interesting how far social media has come, really, hasn't it? Um, I watch those videos and I just love them. It doesn't matter what team, what player. I think it's fantastic that they, you know, they show those things because it is. Um, it's one of those really passionate moments that you get to utilise from the player and and the parents. It's just raw emotion. So um, I do remember making the call to to mum and dad to let them know. But um, yeah, it's just the the tap on the shoulder at training. There was no real hoo ha and um, jumping around on. On one another like it is now um it was just a sort of a nod of the head from the senior boys and um wish you all the best but um i still remember it you know quite vividly i still you know i remember the day that i got the nod and then did my knee that's the one that i sort of can't shake but um yeah to finally get that opportunity it was amazing um you know schwabby was the coach at the time and um yeah debuted against against carlton which was great Jeez, your dad must have been torn it as a Tigers man if you were about to debut against them and the Suns now in their brown and gold. Anyway, it's a tough, tough gig for him. Jake's got a good question for you here. Who was your most annoying teammate and why was it Campbell Brown? <laughs> He's, he actually wasn't. He's one of my favourites of all time, Brownie, and uh, on and off the field. I just I love him. He's a very uh, unique um, beast. But, um, yeah, he definitely wasn't the most annoying uh sam mitchell would be up there in terms of he would just kick footies at your head and it just <laughs> didn't matter who you were or he'd wreck the drill like you're trying to work on something and that little midget would just deliberately <laughs> do it. Um, so yeah it's probably mitch but yeah brownie's definitely not yeah <laughs> when, when did, how long did it take for sammy to mallow then because surely as as he took on a bit more of a leadership he uh had to stop trying to take everyone's head off oh no he never stopped i think he was I remember seeing vision of him at West Coast doing it, you know, and even the other day he was doing it as one of the assistant coaches, you know. He's, yeah, he's a, he's a unique little midget, that one. But um, I think, you know, over time, it, and you, you guys as great Hawks supporters would, would understand his journey and, um, yeah, he had to adapt a, a number of times from, I guess, his leadership strategies and, and things like that. Um, but, yeah, still mm, kicking footies to heads. <laughs> if I can sandwich this in now, we obviously know about the succession plan with Clarko and Sam. How confident are you in Sam's ability to lead the club going forward? Oh, he was born to coach. There's there's no doubt about that. And that's not because I, you know, know him personally or played with him. He He's always been a, a cut above in, in the, the game sense. Um, his knowledge of the game and, you know, initiative to try and create things, you know, him as a, a leader but a midfielder was always coming up with different ways. And, you know, I think I saw something from a West Coast guy the other day. They wouldn't have won it without him and his, you know, strategies. Um, you know, he, he'll make, he'll make a, a fantastic coach. There's there's no doubt in my mind. Um, the transition, we don't know. Um, you know, it's unique. I, I didn't – I sort of felt that obviously there'd been talk of it and um, I highly recommend Sam. But, yeah, I – don't know how that's going to play out. I really do hope it's smooth. Um, Clarko's done so much for us, as you, you're well aware. Um, but I, I just – and knowing Clarko, he's he's true to his word, so he'll put everything into it to make sure it works. But um, Sam's going to be great for our footy club, there's no doubt. Mm. 
tell us. I'm just going to flick up a few um, fan comments as we go, just to uh, let everyone know that we're listening. But um, tell us a little bit about um, your relationship with Clarko and how that formed in his early days. Yeah, um, early days when he, um, I guess, when he got appointed, most of us were away on um, on holidays, and then he called this meeting back in Melbourne, and this is pretty much like just. He was just putting the footprint of where we're heading, I guess. Anyway, he sort of uh, yeah, rang and said, yep, we've got this meeting. And I was like, oh, I'm in Queensland, mate, you know, and some of the other boys are overseas and, and things like that. He said, oh, well, you've got to get back. You've got to be at the meeting. You know, he set, set the tone early. And I was like, geez, yeah, better toe the line. So I flew back and, um, yeah, look, and from that moment, you just knew that he, he was intense and he wanted the best for the group. And, um, but yeah, Early days there, like I learned so much, and um, he, he helped shape my career quite quickly um, with the, the different philosophies he brought in. But it's probably just more that, um, yeah, he was he was your coach, but he was that father figure too. Like he genuinely cared for each individual and you know what they were either going through or had been through. So um, Clarko was fantastic for me, and you know, and, and got my career up and going along with um, a few of the senior boys. Amazing. Let's touch back on uh, your debut. Rick had 12. You kicked a point. Would have been nice to kick a goal in your first game, of course. But um, who did you line up against and uh, how long did it take you to get used to the pace of the game? Um, I, yeah, it was at Optus Oval, um, which was uh, unique in itself um, <laughs> against the Navy Blues. But Trent Spawn was who I lined up on and played most of the day on. Like Back then it was sort of different footy. Um, there wasn't high rotations, um, so I think I played as the forward pocket, um, <laughs> rotating to the bench, which was uh, basically you're in the middle of the ball getting kicked over your head back then. But, um, <laughs> look, yeah, got, got on the end of a couple of touches, and it was an amazing experience. Like, yeah, you just, yeah, words can't describe playing in front of any crowd. Um, but, yeah, look, it was, it was fantastic um, to debut there, and we had a win. It was... Um, a great friend and, and mentor at the time, Jade Rawlings, played his 100th game. So, yeah, some really great memories of that, which is good. Awesome. awesome. Amazing. We just had a family member. Who was that again? Um, yeah, that was my little nephew. Yeah. There you go. Hey, Das. Yeah. You're a champ, Das. Join us, mate. That was a um, legend. Go again. He's a little blonde-headed left footer. He'll be all right. Nice. Is his hero Matthew Knight? Nah, I think he's. I think he's a bomber, actually. Oh no! Yeah. Oh, yeah. we can't be having that. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I have to have words. Sun's <laughs> going on there. So, look, um, geez, the father sons will be all right in the future, don't you think, Lado? With uh, some of the boys you came through with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's a bit going on. The boys have been good. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you've obviously got Mitch, Hodgy, uh, Brownie. Ruffy, Jordan Lewis, um, I've got three boys. Um, Robbie Campbell, Michael Osborne, Chance Bateman, they've, we've all got boys. So there's, yeah. there's others. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed there's a, a few footballs amongst them. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. The, the club cool. had a little bit of fun a while ago sort of trying to name them and I think they've, you know, Crawford and put all the boys just, you know, you don't want to put yeah. any pressure on them. Even I saw, uh, was it Birch? Birch's... Uh, Partner's pregnant. It's like, yeah, yeah, cool. expecting yeah, and a boy yeah. coming. That's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, boys, girls, you know, it's it's all you know. We'll have an AFLW team by then, so uh, it should be good. Yeah, true. Uh, awesome. I don't have it in front of me, Rick, but did you play in the line in the sand game in two thousand and four? Yeah, thankfully for my um, intimidating frame. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what did you weigh then? Tell us how, oh, how much we bench. He's on the bench. I reckon it would have been about 63, 65 kilos, maybe. Oof. Yeah. So you've been working hard for, uh, what was it, a couple of years at that point? Three, Yeah, and then you, you put on three kilos. <laughs> yeah, massive. Yeah. <laughs> the issue was I like running a lot. So yeah. really, I was really struggling to put the, the weight on early. Um, and then we sort of had a bit of a change after that. Couple of years after that, with our regime, and yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. So, who was uh, heading up the fitness then at the time? I reckon when things changed for my body and 
um, and my fitness was when Andrew Russell and Peter Burge were on board. Um, and then, yeah, Alex Clark sort of joined a bit later on in the rehab management sort of side of things. But, yeah, it was just a different type of training and, and weights training, which was great. So, yeah. yeah. Good point there, Jay. You, you, you uh, went very hard and you had – you spent a bit of time in the rehab area, didn't you, mate? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I'm paying for it now. But, um, yeah, I look back at it and, you know, there's a lot of what-ifs in terms of games played, but – you know, I'm still honoured to have made 125 games and I know how many I missed um, through injury. But, yeah, look, I, I I wouldn't change a thing, silly as that sounds. Um, yeah, got some knee issues and stuff as, you know, now and had a hip replacement three years ago. Um, yeah. And that's all just wear and tear from crashing in and, and doing your bit. But, um, yeah, not ideal. I've already picked out a scooter, but, um, yeah. <laughs> No, I did. I, I just learned, even though I was small, yeah, you had to go when it was your turn, that footy terminology. But, yeah, had to do what you had to do for your team members and, yeah, hopefully win a game of footy. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you what else you have to do for teammates, mate. Well, sometimes when the forwards come at you, you've got to hit you. You've got to hit them on the chest. Two thousand and seven, um, the elimination final against Adelaide. Buddy went nuts, announced himself as a big name player. Uh, I'm sick of talking about that, mate. Can we talk about your pass? Because the big yeah. bud would have been nowhere if it wasn't for you lacing yeah. him out. Mm. Yeah, I always had the best view in the house with Big Bud um, coming off half back, and um, oh, it was just you know it was an amazing scene when the big fella was up and about, whether it be him or Ruffy playing well up forward, you just, Ben Dixon back then and Johnny Barker before that, just love seeing him lead out and try and hit him. Um, yeah, and, and that day was pretty special, you know. We were obviously a young emerging group and were basically no chance um, in other people's minds. But, yeah, we, we found ourselves in the game and right at the end there, Croft switched it in. I, I, he still can't believe I was free, um, but they'd all flooded back. So, yeah. Um, yeah, he was pretty happy to pass it off, he said, because the pressure wasn't on him. Um, <laughs> but, yeah I, yeah, I remember it vividly. I just it, Watching it on um, replay or on video, it, it looks like, you know, how did you do that? But it, to me, it just opened up beautifully and I just saw Big Bud and I knew where to put it. Um, worked out all right. And he went back and went bang and, yeah, we hang on and win by a, a few points. Did he get to you after he kicked it? Oh, no, he celebrated with the crowd, yeah, but well, surely... Yeah, it took him a while. <laughs> took him a while. Um, oh, no, he, he got uh, probably more after you know after the sign went because we're all um, pretty happy it went through. But then we're going back to set up and send some numbers behind the ball and all that sort of stuff. So we went into let's make sure we win it mode. And no, he, he came up and had a big cuddle straight after the sign, and and everyone else took over. So that was great. Yeah, good man, bud. Good stuff. What was it like being at the club at that time, bud? Two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight was as close to a rock star as we've seen probably since the 90s. What yeah. was that? What was it like being, in a way, sort of the whole group overshadowed by the uh, the big man at centre forward? It was it was unique. There's no doubt about that. Um, it was exciting. Like, we were, we were a young group with a few few older heads there. But, um, yeah, it was, it was great to watch Bud grow, um, you know, as a footballer but as a person. Yeah. Um, it was insane, and it still is now. Like, he walks into a place and everyone just stops, you know. Um, you know, I brought him, lucky enough, a few of the boys you know, used to come back to Bendio um, just in February every now and then. And I remember one day Big Bud come back and, yeah, it was just insane. We end up just saying, all right, let's go home. Because couldn't, you couldn't go anywhere just to have a beer because it's not like you can hide Bud, can you? Like, he's... No. Yeah, he's yeah. Um, and he's a big man, so but it was it was great um, in a sense because it brought a little bit of extra excitement uh, for a young group. And um, but yeah, we we obviously saw Buddy a lot different than than what people from the outside did. Um, he's he's a very humble um, and loving person and mate. Um, so yeah, it was great. It was exciting. Oh, we've got some good uh, comments going. While you're touching on some good mates, uh, tell us who you were closest to at the club in your playing days, mate. Um, coming through, like, with Mitch and Campbell Brown, um, Hodgie, um, Robbie Campbell in that draft, that was, you know, pretty special. Um, but, yeah, Chance Bateman was one of my best mates. 
all the way through. So I think he was probably one or two years in by the time I got there. But um, him and Michael Osborne, we used to hang out a fair bit. And um, Aussie's a rare talent, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, one of one of my closest mates still is you know Sean Burgoyne. I only got to spend two years with him, but um, that was fantastic. But yeah, Ruffy, Jordan Lewis, you know, they, they were the country boys in a sense. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's it's difficult when you move away and you all go separate ways. But there's one thing that doesn't waver, and that's when you catch up with them now. Um, you know, it's awesome. So, oh, you've just enjoyed your uh, ten years not long ago, uh, the reunion. But uh, we'll, we'll come to that. This is uh, Brett uh, tunes in regularly from the UK. Big Hawks fan. I think that's a massive compliment, mate. Uh, yeah, Rich Porno. Um, Appreciate that. Yeah, no, I would have. I should have grown a mullet. He had a he had a pretty good mullet. <laughs> Well, you tried. It just did back then. Yeah. Up. It was just a bit, <laughs> a bit curly, it was. But uh, I actually got to meet Pritch um, at a function, and um, yeah, it was one of the greatest experiences I've had. Yeah, I don't know if that made some sense to you. Sorry, I didn't do that respect then. Sorry, Pritch. Um, funny interactions with umpires. I do remember a bit of one that involved Razor Ray and Spider, maybe Aussie and you. Does that ring a bell, mate? Oh, there's plenty with Razor. Um, hi, Janelle. Janelle's uh, an avid Hawthorne follower, and whether it be Box Hill or at Hawks Games, you'd always see Janelle. But I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, but, yeah, Razor Ray was actually my favourite umpire. Um, we're not, when we were coming through, um, so Box Hill through to AFL, he was sort of making his mark in the uh, umpiring fraternity as well. And... Yeah, he was one that you just have a bit of a chat with, and he, yeah, he's a unit. But um, I tell you what, when the whistle went and it was fifty-fifty, oh, you're on the end of him, the good good end of the stick in the end with Razor with me. But um, I actually enjoy him. Like I, I know people hate him or you know, get frustrated by him, but um, he's passionate about what he does, and um, yeah, I find him quite humorous. I think For such a good player, that sorry, Matt. Mm. He. Uh, For... he... He's he's passionate in what he does, and if you can get behind, I'll step aside from being a passionate Hawthorne supporter when he drives in <laughs> now, then uh, yeah, you can probably appreciate him. Maybe as I've got older, I can uh, appreciate it a little bit more. <laughs> Yours, is, there, is there any chance, Rick, you could have asked him to help you out uh, when it came to the end of the year awards? Because having a look through, he couldn't look after you with a brown vote, unfortunately. Yeah, on, again, I reckon... Um, yeah, the forwards and the mids steal all the votes. The half backers are the the ones that made them all look real good, didn't we? But, um, <laughs> yeah, I was probably stiff a couple of times, but at the end of the day, for me, like it wasn't about that. I, you know, wanted to just play my role, and um, you hear that so much. But legitimately, that's all I ever wanted to do was do what I was asked to do and and do it just above, you know, what was probably expected. Because then, if you did that, um, you know, you know that your teammates could look you in the eye and. You, you played your role. Um, so that was what I was about. It would have been nice to sneak at least one Brownlow in, but um, <laughs> one vote, that is. I was never going to win one. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I was stitched, stitched up a few times. I was born and Xavier Ellis, for some reason, they got us mixed up. <laughs> they were, maybe Zave had a bit of a louder mouth. I don't know, just guessing. Anyway. He's a bit um, cheeky, Zave. Yeah, he's a bit cheeky. <laughs> at the uh, – oh, at, oh no, go on. Yeah. Quick one by Stephen here. Um, over to you, Lado. Who was the biggest star? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so, like, different eras in a sense. Like, it, that sounds stupid. But uh, Crawford was, was and is massive because he had that media personality to go with it, um, you know, in that time. But, yeah, probably with how it is now, like, Bud's just massive. But I'll probably if you if you get I've got to pick one, I'd go Croft because it was in a time where there's probably not as much social media or if any. And if there was, he probably would have been even bigger than what he was then, which was massive. So not not in height, because he's a midget, Croft, but <laughs> um, yeah, just unique worlds, those two. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, we'll um, jump into 08 in a second, but um, Talking Hawks, we've got a few different partners. So base compression being one uh, for any Talking Hawks fans. Um, sorry, right on top of Lado there. But uh, <laughs> they will give you uh, a 20% discount. They've got some great compression wear gear. Um, and uh, check it out, streetwear gear, men's, women's. Um, I think we're going to be able to 
we've got David Mira, I think, uh, going to come on the show uh, shortly, and he's just got his hands on on some base compression gear. So we'll we'll have a chat. We'll find out from an athlete uh, what, what they think of it. But check it out through um, talkinghawks.com if you want to get on uh, any of the base compression gear. Click on the uh, partners page and you can get twenty percent off when you get something online. So, um, mate, and look, one last thing: YouTube subscribers. We're trying to grow it. Jump on, subscribe if you've got a YouTube account. It doesn't take any time at all. Um, subscribe and get behind us there. Just give us a hand. But, uh, Reese, kick us off. Actually, yeah, kick us off with 08. Give us a few thoughts because I've got, we've got a special moment that uh, Rick was involved in and everyone knows. But, uh, anyway. <laughs> a, uh, a quick fact or fiction, uh, if you don't mind, Rick. Uh, ben Dixon told the story that when Cyril arrived at the club, obviously, at the end of 2007, um, first of all, did you know how special he was going to be when he first rocked up? Yep, I did. It was just, it was just that. that easy to notice. Uh, yeah, I, I'd met him once. Um, probably shouldn't have bought him in Bourbon, but we did. I was with Chance, <laughs> but we just finished school. We had no idea he was going to end up with us. But he was yeah. just, he just had that feeling that he was a ripping kid. Um, and I'd seen a little bit of him play that school footy. It, it, did I think he was going to do what he did in that first season? Probably not, but I wasn't surprised. Um, yeah. He's an amazing player. Yeah. Miss Cyril. Yeah, we all do, mate, believe me. Yeah. Uh, is it true that uh, Damien Hardwick, who was an assistant coach at the time, is it true that he told, uh, I can't remember the other coach's name, but to rip Box Hill out of Cyril's Melways because he'd never go down there? Is that true? Do you know of that story? Yeah, fact. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Too good. Yeah, yeah, that was in my mail ways. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the uh, for the younger fans out there, mail ways is what we had before Google Maps. <laughs> yeah, before Tom Toms and stuff, whatever those yeah. and Siri and Google Maps. Yeah, before we get to the big game, mate, we played Geelong on a really cold Friday night. I think it was round 17. The Cats got uh, the win on that occasion. It wasn't that convincing. How much confidence did the group take that this Cats team, which only lost one game for the year, for you guys were gettable? Oh, massive. That that was our turning point for us. Like to It redirected us a little bit. Um, we identified a, a few things that didn't work on the night. There were just slight tweaks to our, our game style. Um yeah, I think I, I had a shot there, a uh, set shot from pretty much where I had one on grand final day and I missed on the night and they ended up sort of kicking away from it. So I was a bit shirty on myself that night. But around that, we identified some key components to our structures and our game style. And, you know, we didn't have to work on it overly hard. We just tweaked it at training and were consistent with it. And then so we knew that if we just got one more crack at them um, in the finals that we'd, we'd knock them over. And that was genuine relief. Um, because the vision does, does not lie and we knew that we could rectify the situation and, you know, one of them was the, you know, the shark that was drawn up <laughs> on the, in, in the story of that, you know, like you would have seen that, but that was last minute trying to draw a shark on the board, but it was, you know, trying to stop their flow of play and, and things like that, which is around our Clarko cluster as they, they named it. But, yeah, we, so we had massive belief that one more go at them and we'll get them and we, we did. Amazing. One more fact or fiction before Matt gets on to the game. Uh, is it true before the qualifying final against the Dogs uh, at breakfast, Buddy overheard one of the Dogs defenders say he was going to shut Buddy down and he turned around and said, I'm going to drop eight on you, and then he did? <laughs> fact. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> I wasn't there, but that what you just said is something that he would say confidently, knowing that he would. Like. Yeah. People call that arrogant. I, that's just he is a confident human, and he went bang. <laughs> so that's yeah. amazing. The lesson is don't stir butt up. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> a few defenders learned that the hard way, didn't they? Yeah. Um, so, oh wait, you started to really be. You were you played every game that season. Um, you played a few different positions over your career, but like at that in that year and, and heading into the finals, um, mate, you, you had a cracker uh, round twenty one versus West Coast. You had your leading um, disposals game with thirty two. Um, there was twenty two rounds that year, so one game away from the finals, and you, Hawks are humming. Um, at that point, 
in your career, you're probably feeling pretty good about your body. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing in terms of your fitness and your confidence in your body. Were you, were yeah. you sure about what you were, where you were going to be played? Um, tell us about just you on the cusp of the finals. Yeah, that was by far my best season. Um, 07, I probably, I think I missed one game that year. Um, and then, yeah, coming into 08, I just had some continuity with pre-seasons and not as many surgeries. So I didn't get a real clear run at it in those years prior. So, you know, 2002 injured, 2003 play a couple injured and that sort of flowed, flowed on. But, yeah, 06, not too bad, about 16, 17 games. So I built up to about 20, 21 in the 07 and then played every game in 08. And, um, yeah, I, I, just, I was at at peace with my spot in the side and knew what I had to do. And um, I was a bit of a, a go-to sometimes for, you know, the odd little run with for a short period of time or um, but potentially mainly at half back. I'd, I'd play that running half back and take the game on. And, you know, back then we used to try and nullify, you know, like a, a small forward that we'd allow to get a lot of ball, you know, the other side of centre. So, you know, Boomer Harvey, for instance, you'd allow them up and Gary Ablett's, they could have 20, 30 the other side of um, their forward half and that was no worries. But, yeah, that West Coast game, I actually played on ball most of the night, um, which was different for me um, at that level. So I really enjoyed that challenge and, um, yeah, did, didn't have a bad night that night. But um, I was really confident going into the finals in terms of just, you know, where we're at. We knew, knew each other so well and our structures and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, definitely reasonably confident going in. And my body was sound. So um, then I spoke too soon because in the qualifying final, I uh, did my shoulder in I think, the second quarter. So, um, yeah, if they had have found what was wrong with it, then I wouldn't have played the rest of the final series. So I'm glad they, the scan didn't show anything and wow. uh, got through the next couple. So yeah, that's Beautiful. A bit, of a, uh, bit of a pineapple under the table to the, whoever was scanning you, was it? To, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I honestly don't know how they missed it, but I'm glad they did. So yeah. Um, so yeah. were you getting grabbed up to, to get through the next couple of games? Yeah, yeah. So I didn't come back on after half time against Bulldogs. Um, hardly trained pre St Kilda. We obviously had a week off, I think then. And then, um, yeah, I even still, I just had a heap of tests trying to find out what was wrong with it. And yeah, I was just in agony at these tests, but nothing was showing up on the scan. I'm like. I think I'm a coward. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely can't lift my arm up above my head. Um, and I ended up getting, yeah, I, I had an injection for the last training run because I knew I had a test. Uh, and if I didn't get through, if I didn't tackle in the pre-grand final training, I oh, wouldn't have played. So snuck a jab in there and, uh, yeah, game day would have had a couple, grand final day. Um, yeah. So yeah, I wasn't happy with my finals performances. I had to sort of adjust the way I played and, and just concentrate on, um, I guess, nullifying the players I was on, which was mainly Chapman, and he was injured as well. So it wasn't too bad. Mm. Yeah. Leno, when it came to grand final week, how calming of an influence was Stuart Dew, given that he was, um, number one, probably the most criticised player in that pre-season, um, <laughs> given the fact that he showed up, let's just say, in post-retirement um shape not that i am one to judge absolutely not believe me but uh he had the 2004 grand final experience so how much did he help during the week given that it seemed like no one outside of the footy club uh especially some fans at least didn't really give you guys much of a chance yeah dewey was great but i think over the course of the year dewey dewey's experience and his i guess in a sense his fatherly figure um wore off on a lot of us um it was just that calming influence and um yeah so th the week itself he was great but he'd, he'd already sort of helped a lot of us understand what was required throughout the season so um he was great but you know even Croft, someone that hadn't um been a part of that he was probably one of the best throughout that week at um mm -hmm. you know getting us all to channel like i guess channel our um our feelings and emotions because it it's just an emotional roller coaster the whole week um you know yeah oh, it was very sleepless i'll give you the hot tip but um <laughs> yeah but dewey was fantastic well what 
what a year and what a game he had. But um, oh. I learned so much from him in, in 12 months um, on and off the field. Um, he was a big boy, but he, he got the job done. And, yeah, was, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was big. watching a replay and, and um, one of the commentators talked about it being a hot day and, and someone carrying a few extra kilos, you wouldn't think he'd do so well. But, uh, mate, he, uh, <laughs> he showed him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the rocks proved him wrong, definitely. We've we've got um we've got a little bit of stuff teed up. Are you okay to stay a little bit longer with this, Lado? Yeah, yep, yeah. All good. Champ. All right. Um, Reese, you got any others? I'm just going to scan some comments from the fans. Yeah, go for it, Lado. Were you as in awe? Sorry, were you in as in awe on the field at what Stewie Jew did in that third quarter as to what the fans were? Because that's as close as we'll see to Hawthorne fans internally rioting just on how good <laughs> this third quarter was. Well, it was unbelievable. Oh, look, I was just—I was always in awe at half back, to be honest. And that day, um, the noise was ridiculous. Um, but playing half back, and and you watch, you get everything in front of you. It's just a beautiful spot to play, and especially when you've got guys like him turning the game on its head. But you've got Buddy and Cyril running around and Big Ruff. Like it's best seats in the house for me. And um, but that day, like yeah, I watch that vision and still get you know tingles. It's just amazing um because you know the work that went into it and you knew our plan and and things like that but just to see him it come off and and he he he's the one that broke the game open like try and script that <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's amazing um here we go from dan sheriff uh good on you dan for joining us Lado, yeah. how much planning went into that um g'day dan um yeah look it it was there was a strategy for the year because we felt that we were the best kicking side in the competition, and uh, you know you can't go past the left footer, can you, boys? So, no, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> the idea was, and it, it turned out grand final though. There was a lot of behinds, and some were you know ridiculously rushed. But the plan was you could reset. So if you kept it in, the pressure's on. There was nothing saying that you couldn't rush it. So you'd rush it, and we get we start fresh again. So every chance we got, we we're always going to rush it behind because then. You know, Hodgie or myself or Brent Guerra or Birchall would grab the footy and we'd kick it in. Now, whether we kicked it to the pocket or we found someone in the middle, we were just better off stop starting the play so that we could then set up our forward thrust, I guess. So um, a, a lot of planning in, in, in a sense. It was probably just more smartness around, and it was Clarko's innovative ways. Let's just rush it and then it's in our hands again rather than just, yeah, take it on. Oh, that's Ooh. a yeah. oh. <laughs> oh. Cyril won't be watching because I can say bud. Um, <laughs> no, nah, look, it, I seriously cannot, um, I cannot split them. Like two completely different types of players, but, you know, I, the amount of times I just catch myself just with my jaw hitting the deck um, with either of them. Um, I think from a flashy sense, you know, Cyril, but just from that in awe, this big unit taking a game by the, the throat and Bud being the size that he is covering the ground, you'd, you'd probably, I'd, I'll say Bud just to give you one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hold on. Yeah. Uh, we, we, well, hey, thanks, I've, got, I've got people yeah. tampering some comments here. There's, you don't, don't interrupt the build up here. Hold on, hold yeah. on. We've got a few good ones. Let's, we'll, Jake, we'll come to that in a second. Um, <laughs> Chris, yeah. Chris is behind the scenes causing me grief here. He's ribbing me. Um, <laughs> so the uh, someone had a question. How bad was Hodgy? Here we go, Stephen. How bad was uh, Hodgy after the 08 prelim with his ribs? Yeah, look, he, he'll never tell anyone. But uh, he cop, you know, he copped a he copped a big knock. Um, but did he miss training? No, nah. <laughs> he wasn't missing training. Uh, it was it was significant. Yeah, like. A lesser man probably wouldn't have played. Well, and then he was fighting up. And he, yeah. he was he was exposing his ribs, like not yeah. not fully, but like he was just like they were giving it to him at the start of the game, and he was just like, "Yep." Yeah, and he basically said he, he knew what was going to come. Um, just like let him come at me, you know they're going to focus on me. Good luck. But he, he was coughing up blood, you know, in that final, and then you know copped a couple more knocks on grand final day. But you know that's why Hodgie's a legend of the game. He's just, yeah. you know, <laughs> heart and soul. That's it. 
Look, we kicked so accurately that day. The reward for all of the, you know, the the planning and the the hard yards, the blood, sweat, and tears, it was incredible. And um, you commented on the 305 game Marine Croft um, and, and the pressure um, when he's come over to you. And I just want to uh, take all the fans back here. So enjoy, enjoy, everyone. Last quarter, we had a big lead, but Rick Ladson. Uh, he got the 50 metre from Tom Harley and I just knew he would kick it. And I said to him, no pressure, mate, but you kick this, we're going to win the bloody premiership. And he went back and I had no doubt whatsoever and he put it straight through. He went down on one knee and it was happening. Hawks were premiers, the underdogs, 2008, it doesn't get any better. And really, can it get much better than beating the Cats? Courtesy, uh, Hawthorne Football Club, a Croft 08 memory, and it was all about you, mate. Uh, that was amazing, and there's been a lot of comments through that we've sort of glossed over until this moment. Mate, how was that? What was going through your head when Croft's come over, saddled it up and said, mate, this is it? Oh, there's a fair few things. Um, <laughs> you mentioned earlier, like, it was a hot day, and I'd done a lot of running around just trying to nullify Chappie and... Um, late in the game there, like I'd actually done a massive Yui <laughs> around the MCG, just running like a headless crook. And then I've come back up at the footy and got it kicked to me. Um, I actually cramped in my hamstrings and adductors um, and my calf on the walk where we got the 50. So I was, well, one, trying to breathe and get rid of some um, cramp. And then we got a 50 meter pen, uh, the 50 meter penalty. Dewey got a blood nose, I think. So that gave a bit of time. And um, yeah, Croft come over. And I, I was sitting on two goals nine for the year, so I wasn't confident. And then um, so I'm thinking, yeah, like I've got to got to kick this. I'm, I'm kind of within range. Um, and then Croft wanders over, and um, you know he was a massive um, mentor for a lot of us, but me in particular. Um, and knowing the significance of the moment for him, um, and then he comes over and he, he genuinely said, if you kick this, we win the grand final, which he thought he was being positive. <laughs> <laughs> when you watch it now, like, we, we, we had the game, but you never know. And, you know, that, that probably put a nail in the coffin as such. But, yeah, I was nervous um, and it came off pretty well. And if I didn't get the blood rule, there's no way that I would have made the distance. But... um come off beautifully and went through and rest is history, but amazing. Um, yeah, and I love love Croft to bits and I was just happy that it, it came off because it makes a pretty good story. No, I, it was incredible and it was a hot day and I reckon I'd drunk a few by that point and I was <laughs> up, on, uh, up on my chair with my brother and just going bananas. Mate, um, the, uh, <laughs> the, someone said it a bit earlier. Did you put a little bit of mayo on that push? Um, it was like it was like, I knew he was coming, so... At the moment, he was there, like sort of lost my footing. Um, but yeah, the hand went in there. But I was just tired, so like I was playing on it, hoping, um, but not like a, a stage dive as such. Uh, strategic, I call it. Um, and I think there's a little <laughs> bit of uh, oh, a bit of hoo-ha. Once I got the fifty, I did a bit of a finger twirl. I was just there in another planet because the the crowd genuinely just it takes you takes over you. Like when I kicked the the goal, for instance, and I put my hands in the air, like that's all I was going to do. And then the sound just like it genuinely just takes over and you just, it's just the most amazing experience. You know, I've been in the crowd, you know, watching them win the three-peat and stuff and that's amazing. But when you're out on that ground and the crowd's just going absolutely bananas, it's it's one of the greatest feelings of all time. So maybe this is that, that whole dynamic right there you just explained. Maybe that's why Bud took a while to run around and, and find you when you first set him up because he, <laughs> that, that, he just had that magnetism all the time for the crowd. So. 100%. <laughs> so, Lado, when the siren goes, and you've already said about the crowd and it would have been at its uh, climax in that moment, do you get a split second to actually go, oh, my God, we've actually won, or does the adrenaline kick in straight away and pandemonium begin? Yeah, no, nah, adrenaline straight away. Um, I remember vividly the siren going and I turned over to my right and Brownie was there and um, I've actually got a great, like it's a framed photo of the MCG and that, the Kodak moment when the siren goes and I'm 
I've jumped up on top of him and he's hugging me and he was bawling his eyes out. So, um, yeah, like just pure adrenaline. The ball was right up the other end, so plenty of the boys were amongst it and wrestling each other and that, but it, it does. You're just going to pandemonium and you just can't believe what's going on. Um, and then, yeah, you're just, just an emotional mess running around and trying to get to as many people as you can and, and soak up the atmosphere and... Um, even though you do a bit of a lap and that, it's probably something that I, I wish I'd have done for a bit longer was just um, probably, yeah, lap it up for a little bit longer out there because it's just an amazing feat. Like, and then the experience and, you know, I remember stopping and having a chat and high five with a few fans and just not, you know, knowing what it meant to them. But, yeah, just an amazing, amazing feeling. Well, that's what you, uh, you know, as the lad that was just enjoying his footy when he came in as a 17-year-old, that's what it was uh, all about, I guess, that moment, hey? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, you set out to, all you wanted to do, or all I wanted to do was play AFL and um, to get to that moment and, you know, be a premiership player, it's, um, yeah, it's phenomenal, you know. That Again, a lot of hard work goes into it for a lot of people, but, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So you've got a, uh, a date every 10 years now. How was it getting together with the boys in uh, 2018 to, to reminisce? Yeah, no, it's, um, and that's the good part about them too. You get to catch up and have a couple of quiet ones and, and reminisce a few stories. But, yeah, we had a, a bit of a get-together at, at a game. I think they might have played Adelaide at the MCG on a Saturday night, I reckon. Um, so, yeah, we went to the game together and we're up in a function. Um, it was a big weekend because, yeah, we had – um, two other premierships as well. So I think it was 78 or 88 and 98 maybe? No, 88 and 78. 78, yeah. 78. So we had a few of the old school boys there as well. So that was just cool. You know, like they're, they're catching up for, you know, another time. And so we got to share it with a few of them. And um, then on the Sunday we had a, a club function as well. And, again, you're with your teammates um, and – and some of those club legends to, to reminisce premiership glory. And you, you can't beat having sort of Tucky and that <laughs> up on stage talking about their stories. And um, no, it was a great weekend. And yeah, already counting down the days to, to the next one. Yeah. I was fortunate to get along to a, a Hawks in business that uh, uh, Stephen Gillam, your uh, premiership teammate, uh, uh, now at the club, helping uh, get a, a lot of things organised with um, the corporate events. But, yeah, went along to a hooked-in business and just sitting with some of the past um, premiership players and, you know, fellas in their 60s and 70s. And it is um, obviously very – you still see the special bond that they've got amongst, you know, mm. their, their partners and, and together and, you know, looking out for each other. It's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty special thing that we've got at the Hawthorne Football Club. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. Mate, I might change gears a little bit. Chop yeah, clock. Sure. It's back. All right, fans. So, uh, Lado, we've got 30-odd seconds. Mate, first thing that comes to mind, fast fire, question and answer. There's no preparation for this, but you're the man. You're the most prepared guest we've had Look with your lighting and your plants. So, thank you, uh, <laughs> Mr. Um, mate, all righty, here we go. Rick Ladson, here's the shot clock for you. As a child, what did you want to do when you grew up? I felt footballer. All right, easy one. What was your most hated part of training as an AFL player? Oh, recovery. Ice baths? Yeah. <laughs> um, who was your funniest teammate at the Hawks? Oh, there's a few. Campbell Brown, Michael Osborne. Who was the most annoying teammate and why? Oh, it's Said about him earlier, but Mitch, he just had a way to just stuff your day up. <laughs> um, which which opponent was the best trash talker? Jeez, <laughs> uh, there's a few over the journey. Um, nah, there's probably nah, not not good trash. That's no, nah, I can't even name them. No, nah, that's too good. No, they weren't. Great. <laughs> <laughs> what about who had the mantle at the Hawks? As best trash talker, oh, or worst, or oh, worst, yeah. <laughs> Xavier Ellis was pretty bad. Um, <laughs> if someone was, to, if if someone um, 
Stuart Hodgie up. He had a fair fair lip on him too, but um, at least he backed it up. Yeah, Mitch was pretty good. Mitch was a he was a trash talker. Yeah, uh, probably a hard one to say quickly. But your biggest lesson learned from Clarko? Yeah, oh yeah, probably can't say it on here. He's the main one, but um, <laughs> oh, look, it, it's yeah, it was just purely about you know honesty in the way that he conducted yourself on and off the field. Yep, very good. First word that comes to mind when I say the words mm -hmm. Sam Mitchell, small, Luke Hodge, legend, <laughs> Shane Crawford, super dad. If Stewart I could Jewett. throw one in there, please, Matt. Peter Schwab, your first coach. Love Schwabby. Love him. First word with Schwabby. Um, caring. All right. Well, we better throw in Chang out. Chance Bateman. Oh, well, yeah. Brother. Awesome. Um, which team did you look forward to playing the most? Because you're allowed at this point, post career, you know, talk it up. Who was your bunny? Who, who did you love playing because you knew you'd dominate? Oh, Carlton. Carlton. I reckon you had some good games against the Roos as I look back against his stats too. But yeah, uh, one where I got to rub Adam Simpson's head into the ground, that was one of my favourite moments. <laughs> we'll He'd love that. Moment that one. <laughs> Rick Ladson, thank you for doing Talking Hawk Shot Clock. Um, awesome, mate. So, post footy now, uh, you're a dad, you're a family man, you've gone back to your roots at the country, but you, you spent a little bit of time coaching at the Bombers um, post your AFL career. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, it wasn't much great that came out of that. Um, <laughs> but now nah, they've got. Obviously, um, it was a connection with the Bendigo Gold at the time in the VFL and um, Hayden Skipworth, who's yeah, a fantastic coach. I think he's at, the, at Collingwood now um, doing midfield or forward coaching. But at the time, he was a development coach at Essendon. Um, so he contacted me and we had a bit of a chat about the Bendigo connection and having a, a job with Essendon as development coach, but, um, you know, under another three. So it was, you know, just working with the first of three players and um, also then playing VFL for Bendigo Gold um, and being a leader amongst that, I guess. So um, it was a last minute decision and, you know, I learned a lot. It was, you know, when you've been in a, um, a club such as Hawthorne for 10 years, you, you only know one way. So um, it was a bit of a, an eye opener to see how, I guess, another club does things and how they think and, what they do, all that sort of stuff. But um, yeah, met some great people along that, that, um, that well, probably 10 months I was there. Um, Herdy, I can't speak highly enough of Herdy. He was, um, he was phenomenal as a, um, as a coach, but as a mentor to us younger coaches. Um, and then, yeah, Hayden Skipworth was great, but Sean Wellman, you know, he's a fantastic footballer as well, but he was a very uh, knowledgeable coach at the time. And, um, Mark Bomber Thompson was there, and you know, look, we know what's sort of played out post that, but those guys can't speak highly enough of them. Mm. Uh, but yeah, got the the chance to play a little bit of Bendigo Gold stuff and come back to Bendigo, and yeah, and then I I pulled the pin there and ended up coming back to Bendigo the year after to play and and coach Golden Square Seniors um, in 2013. Did all right, um, coaching them. Yeah, executive premiership. Yeah, no, I inherited a pretty good um, side, but about a week before I signed on, we lost the full forward who kicked about 100 a year for probably six years or something. Um, so I think in the years prior, he kicked 140-odd and 160 the year before that. And so he went out the door just before I signed. So, um, yeah, going for our fifth flag was a challenge. And, yeah, fortunately, we had a younger group sort of come in and I – I sort of nurtured them at the start and played them and the uh the loyal golden square fans uh didn't like what i was doing of course but um yeah it paid off and we we ended up getting the chocolates and winning our fifth flag in a row at the time so that was fantastic amazing mate we'll uh we'll wrap it up shortly but um if there's any last quick questions or, or thoughts from the fans um drop them in um and and Lada, you've got to be one of the bravest men i know um not because you survived training with Brownie and Hodgkin, <laughs> Mitchell's uh, 
football, but you took on the coaching, coaching mantle down at Bendigo and then you not only coach your wife, but you're actually coaching with her. So she's in the women's team. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Yeah, a couple of years ago, so the um, she was, she played her first year of footy in 2018, I think it was, and um, a fair few of them didn't want to travel to Melbourne and whatnot, so um, they wanted to yeah play locally. And anyway, about three weeks out from the season, it all come to together, and they asked me to coach. And yeah, and we got the got a team up and going within a few weeks, and that was uh, yeah 2019, and we yeah won every game, won the the grand final that year, which was cool. Um, my wife played round one and then I um, delisted her because she was uh, pregnant with our third boy. So she knew, yeah, she knew and then didn't tell me until after round one because she wanted to at least play one game. And then, wow. um, so I reckon it'd be hard to talk. I don't reckon there's a coach out there that's coached their wife and delisted them in the same season. Or coached so. a pregnant wife. That's yeah, it. On the, on the, all the, on the yeah, all the above. It, but, um, it makes yeah, AFL yeah. players getting managed a bit soft. <laughs> oh, you've got a niggle, do you, mate? No, sorry, we've got a pregnant player. If that's um, got a if you really want to complain, yeah. goodness me. Um, yeah, look, it was. It's been good fun, and and this season we missed obviously missed last year, but um, yeah, things are going pretty well, and the girls are going going along beautifully at the moment. We're sitting on top, and. I think we've got another four games to go, so looking forward to the end of that. But um, yeah, it's been a, it's a nice little um, reminder of why you love footy when you you sort of go back to basics. And the girls are great; they they try and implement everything you try and teach them. And um, yeah, they they're great, great. Amazing. Over to you, Reese. Uh, we'll just get you to answer this question really quickly, Lado. Before you do, actually, what do you like as a fan? Are you still as passionate? Uh, watching the Hawks 10 years after you've retired? Oh, look, I've got so much respect for the, the football club and, um, you know, what they have they did for me in, in my time there. And um, I, I really do enjoy getting back there. Um, I probably distanced myself there for a couple of years, to be honest. I just sort of had a bit of a spell from footy, being a footy head, I guess. Um, but, yeah, now, like, two of my three boys um, are just footy mad. The third one won't be far off. He just can't talk yet. He's only he's only one. But um, <laughs> they're just mate, he, 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 mad. Took the field. he took the field when he was minus something years of age. Yeah, that's so. right. He's, he's already played one game. He took a couple of if, pack marks. If you had to bet on it, will his first word be Bud or Cyril? Yeah, well, that's true. It depends what highlights <laughs> tape he's watching. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Nah, so I, I do follow them closely um, and I will – you know, forever. I'm a Hawthorne man and, you know, I did. I grew up Richmond, but the moment I stepped inside those four walls, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be premiership player, but, you know, life member as well. And they're things I cherish um, and, yeah, don't don't take lightly. Lado, it's been amazing. Um, thank you very much for being so generous with your time. You're a very humble guy and uh, love your values. One club player, premiership player. Um, you come through with an amazing crop and have many stories so uh thank you very much for joining us tonight and uh helping out with the fan questions we would uh we'd love to maybe get uh maybe we could see if chance we would reunite the the brothers and uh yeah. maybe get go together or something you can you can tell a few stories to us that uh it would uh be good if you'd answer his phone so if he sees this thank you fine <laughs> All right, we'll send that one express. I think he's in WA still. Yeah, but, mate, no, thank you. Seriously, very genuinely, uh, Hawks fans, we've um, we've been very fortunate to have a, a number of former players. And, and look, talking Hawks, um, one quick finishing note. Um, to those that have helped sponsor um, the rookie, Denver Granger Barris, um, Jeff Kennett gave us a football. It was autographed by uh, Kennedy a Senior and um, Graham Arthur, who, who recently passed. And um, fortunately, one of the... Uh, we, we found a buyer for that ball, and so we've rolled that money into um, now sponsoring Jai Newcomb. So uh, Talking Hawks sponsoring two players this season um, for our second year of just having a crack at uh, putting our, our ugly mugs on uh, on this. Uh, we're, we're very proud to be doing that and uh, giving back to the club. And, and like you, uh, Lado, very, very uh, grateful that uh, you're giving back now. So uh, we'll wrap it up. 
Um, thanks again for your time, um, Reese. Thank you. And uh, fans, thank you. Uh, leave it there. Thanks, Good night, thanks so much. And thanks to everyone that joined in. Awesome, mate. Thank Go you. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.